The next talk is Preemptive Analgesia, Does It Work? by Dr. Michael Barrington from Australia. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, preemptive Analgesia. I have no disclosures to make as per the previous presentation. So a few important definitions for this topic are preemptive analgesia and also preventative analgesia. And the definition of preemptive analgesia stems from animal experiments and is a fairly strict definition. And it refers to when a preoperative treatment is more effective than the identical treatment administered after the incision or surgery. And the theory behind this is that if we block the noxious stimuli that occur during surgery, particularly at the time of the surgical incision, it will reduce central sensitization and therefore um, reduce uh, post-operative pain. But preventative analgesia is far less restrictive and preventative analgesia is probably more relevant to our current practice. Preventative analgesia refers to post-operative pain or when post-operative pain or analgesic consumption is reduced relative to another treatment, a placebo or treatment, or no treatment, as long as this effect is observed at a point in time that exceeded the expected duration of action of the intervention. Now, in the case of preventative analgesia, the timing is not so important. So it doesn't have to occur preoperatively, it can occur intraoperatively and postoperatively. In fact, attending to blockade of those noxious stimuli during the entire perioperative period is what preventative analgesia is all about. And likely, this is the most effective therapy that we can institute preventative analgesia. In the case of the duration of the intervention, we're usually talking about drugs, and so we're talking about pharmacological duration, and, and it's usually defined as if the duration of analgesia extended beyond 5.5 um, half-lives um, of, the, of the drug. So the goal of both these techniques is to prevent chronic post-surgical pain. And chronic post-surgical pain is triggered by the surgery um, without another cause of the pain. And, it, and when it's defined as chronic, when it, when it lasts for longer than two months and when that pain was not present preoperatively, and this is a major epidemiological public health issue, chronic post-surgical pain. The reported incidence of patients having this condition following common operations is between 5 and 50 per cent. And this includes operations such as mastectomy, uh, inguinal hernia repair, thoracotomy, um, operations that occur very commonly. And there are a lot of risk factors for chronic post-surgical pain. And these risk factors are really relevant to this discussion. And some of the preoperative risk factors I've listed there, which include the presence of preoperative pain, whether they're having repeat surgery, their psychological vulnerability, such as catastrophizing, other psychological factors, such as avoidance behavior, anxiety. Younger age adults are more susceptible to chronic post-surgical pain as are the female gender. And there are also genetic factors. The risk factors for chronic post-surgical pain are, are very complex. There are other factors. The surgical approach makes an enormous amount of difference in whether there's been nerve infringement or nerve injury. And many of you would be very aware that our surgeons do pay a lot of attention to, um, to their surgical technique with the, with the goal of minimising uh, tissue trauma and, and hopefully mi minimising the effects of central sensitisation. And so when we look at the data, looking at the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain, we've got to be mindful of the fact that surgical techniques have evolved significantly, and those, those improved surgical techniques, such as minimally invasive surgery, potentially will reduce the incidence of post-surgical pain. There are other important factors that occur post-operatively, post and this is where what we do can make a difference. So poorly controlled acute post-operative pain is related to a higher incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. So we can make a difference by attending to post-operative analgesia through, a, through an extended perioperative period. Radiation therapy and chemotherapy are also associated with increased incidence of post-surgical pain, depression, anxiety, and again, psychological vulnerability. And then there are social factors, such as social isolation, or lack of, or increased support. 
and we must, we, I'm sure many of us have seen a patient who's been, um, I'd just describe as precious, and given too much attention from their family, for example, and it's made it difficult to uh, look after them in the post-operative period. There are a few meta-analyses looking at the evidence for preemptive anal pre analgesia, uh, but most of the studies are old, and that reflects the changes in attitude to preemptive anal analgesia and a more focus on the less restrictive definition of preventative analgesia. But the most recent meta-analysis by Ong did demonstrate significant reductions in improvements, uh, a significant preemptive analgesic effect for epidural local anaesthetic techniques, um, but also for lo other local anaesthetic techniques such as wound catheters. In that meta-analysis, NMDA, NMDA receptors and ant receptor antagonists such as ketamine had no effect, no preemptive effect. And then uh, non-steroidals may play a role in uh, reducing analgesic consumption, but the, no the literature on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is clouded by retractions of uh, randomised control trials. But some authors have re-analysed re the meta-analyses after taking out the retracted, or retracted studies and they, decided, they concluded it didn't make much difference. Now, opioids do not have a preemptive effect, nor do general anaesthetic agents. The difficulty with this, these studies are methodological. There are differences in inclusion criteria. There are differences in the way pain is measured in terms of the pain score calculations. And if you look at the modern literature, it's not so much a measurement of uh, VAS scores or numerical rating scales, but more looking at um, a more, more broader range of measuring uh, functional outcomes. Most of the studies that were performed in this area did not recognise the complexity of pain and particularly the development of chronic pain and they did not include psychological, emotional and physical variables or other established risk factors for chronic pain. And then there are genetic factors which opens up a whole uh, area of, of complexity. So these are the things that need to be attended to in studies if we're going to be definitively say that preemptive analgesia works. So with these improved, I guess, knowledge and research comes uh, reflection. And preemptive analgesia was a concept that was developed in the 1980s. It was developed as a direct uh, extension or extrapolation of animal studies. The results in humans never matched the magnitude of the results in animal experiments. Although there's evidence for preemptive analgesia for certain interventions in humans, particularly, for example, epidural administration of local anaesthetics, the magnitude of the preemptive analgesia is modest at best. So preemptive analgesia as a sole um, therapy is, an, is inadequate. We do need to have a broader approach and we need to focus on the, the um, we need to realise that just the preoperative blockade of the intraoperatives or the blockade of the intraoperative nociceptive stimulus is inadequate. And the focus should be on the blockade of the nociceptive inputs that, include, that occur throughout the entire perioperative period. So what works in terms of preemptive and preventative analgesia? We know that multimodal analgesia regimens with different classes of analgesic drugs work, specifically for acute pain management. But these, th these, um, these interventions have not been studied in detail for preemptive analgesia. There's one study of colonic sh surgery that showed a suite of um, perioperative multimodal analgesia did work with preemptive analgesia, but it's difficult to tease out the individual components. And there's little information over, it's generally considered there's little information to re recommend specific preventative or therapeutic interventions. At least that was the opinion of, a, of prominent uh, investigators in this area, Kellett and Rathmel. But we do know that the perioperative administration of gabapentin and pregabalin are effective in reducing the incidence of persistent post-surgical pain. The exact dosages and the exact duration of therapy is yet to be determined. We have to acknowledge that the gabapentinoids do have side effects, particularly drowsiness. The NMDA receptor antagonists such as ketamine have a very marked preventative effect. So this is good news. This is a simple intervention. But on the other hand, many patients I find in my practice don't tolerate ketamine infusions in the post-operative period. Epidural local anaesthetic techniques do have a preemptive effect, and this is evidence from 
meta-analyses, but as I mentioned before, the magnitude of the effect is modest. Just want to focus on other local anaesthetic techniques. The use of paravertebral blocks for mastectomies is associated with a reduction in persistent post-surgical pain at six months, and the numbers needed to treat is five, which is relatively low. And this is from a Cochrane review, but only included two randomised control trials with a total of 89 patients. But more modern work on, on paravertebral block for mastectomy does um, confirm those results. And this, this is a study that's been published since that Cochrane review. And in this study, uh, this, in, this is a follow-up to a previous randomised control trial. Patients had a multi-day ambulatory continuous paravertebral block following mastectomy. Reduced pain was the primary endpoint and pain-related interference with physical and emotional, emotional functioning on day one. On follow-up, there was a reduced incidence of persistent post-surgical pain at one year in the patients who had ropivacaine infusion versus saline. So this is evidence that paravertebral blocks do have a preventative analgesic effect. But it's important to note that this was a secondary outcome. It wasn't the primary outcome of, of the study. And it's also important to point, even at 28 days, the incidence of severe pain was very low in this group of patients. So in conclusion, preventative analgesia which refers to reduced post-operative pain or analgesic use beyond a known duration of action of the drug does occur. It occurs with local anaesthetic techniques such as epidural, paravertebral and wound infiltration. It occurs with garbapentinoids and it occurs with ketamine. And our current multimodal analgesic strategies are, are worthy of continuing because they do reduce acute post-operative pain and do have a worthy, humane uh, role in perioperative care. Thank you for your attention.